Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode 18 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today's episode is a solo episode derived from my own research. This is the story of Nikolai Koklov, the assassin who came in from the cold. Koklov was a Soviet war hero and a highly capable intelligence agent and assassin when he was selected for a dangerous mission outside of the USSR in 1953. His mission was to find and kill a Russian dissident living in Frankfurt, West Germany, named Gregory Okolovich. Koklov traveled to Frankfurt as he was ordered, but once he arrived, the actions he took shocked his superiors in Moscow and opened a new chapter in the Cold War. Nikolai Evgenievich Koklov proved his worth to the Soviet government from a very young age, starting before the Second World War even began. Prior to the German invasion, he was already a member of the Young Communist League, and he had his own aspirations to become an actor in the Soviet film industry. He also worked in a vaudeville act, which conducted live performances in Moscow. Early on, he gained a few small roles in several films in the late 1930s. However, Everything changed, of course, when war broke out between Germany and the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941 after Germany nullified the Molotov-Ribbentrop Act, which was a non-aggression treaty the two nations signed as Germany went on the offensive in Western Europe. So after the German forces invaded Soviet territory, Nikolai was initially rejected for military service because of his poor eyesight. However, as the situation became more desperate for the Soviet Union, as the German military made rapid gains toward Moscow, Nikolai was recruited as an asset of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, which we know by the acronym NKVD. An older member of the vaudeville union where Koklov was working at the time spotted and assessed him as having the potential for intelligence work and recommended him to his contacts in the NKVD for recruitment. So at just 19 years old, Nikolai was already assigned to a paramilitary demolitions battalion within Moscow, but he was released from that assignment to go to the NKVD afterwards. By this time in the war, the Soviet government was already sacrificing millions of lives in an effort to overwhelm the advancing Germans, and Nikolai had no desire to be one of those who was sacrificed. His own father and stepfather had already died in the war. His father was serving as a battalion commander in the Soviet army until he made an offhand comment to one of his junior soldiers that Stalin was as responsible as Hitler for the Soviet Union's recent losses. This young soldier that he commented to thought that his own loyalty to the Soviet government was being tested by his commander, and so he immediately reported his commander's comments to the unit's political officer. Those comments by themselves were enough to get Nikolai's father reassigned to a punitive battalion, which was given the most dangerous missions of all, and consequently he was killed pretty quickly in fighting against the Germans. Likewise, Nikolai's stepfather had also joined the fight against the invading Germans, but he was just a lawyer, had no real martial experience or capabilities, anything like that, and he too died almost immediately in fighting against the German army. Once Moscow was under pressure by German forces in the fall of 1941, Nikolai was selected for what was essentially a suicide mission against high-ranking German officers during the upcoming battle for Moscow. Because the Soviet capital city was on the verge of falling to the invading German army, a last-ditch effort was mounted to target and kill German officers once they let their guard down. So Nikolai and three other young NKVD agents were tasked to operate undercover as a vaudeville quartet that would entertain the Germans as they celebrated their successful occupation of Moscow. Nikolai himself, from his earlier experience in vaudeville, was already an accomplished whistler, 
which had gotten him accepted into the vaudeville union in the first place. And this talent would become his cover for action during the operation. Once the German officers were gathered in an audience for the vaudeville show, the performers would instead attack and kill as many of them as possible. The team of four decided to use Nikolai's deceased stepfather's apartment as their base of operations in Moscow. While they waited for the arrival of the German army on the outskirts of the city, they received training in explosives and small arms from a more experienced NKBD operative until they were reasonably proficient. Afterwards, they moved on to training in tradecraft and even in international etiquette, including customs and mannerisms they would need if they were interacting with high-ranking German officers at a formal celebratory kind of dinner. Fortunately for Nikolai and for the other members of his team, the operation was canceled because the German army never fully took Moscow as they had anticipated by the end of 1941. Nikolai, I'm sure he breathed a big sigh of relief because he thought that this plan would have ended with all four of them very quickly killed. But his aptitude for the training and the work he'd been given with the NKVD thus far brought him to the attention of none other than Pavel Sudoplatov, that is the NKVD's chief of wet work. Sudoplatov is a very, very famous figure in Soviet Cold War era history. Sudoplatov himself came to Nikolai's apartment on New Year's Day, 1942, and disbanded the quartet because their mission was canceled. But he offered Nikolai an opportunity to further serve Russia, this time in Germany itself. Nikolai eagerly accepted, and afterwards he became known by the codename Whistler in all of his future operations with Soviet intelligence. Nikolai's first task in his new role was to travel to Ankara, Turkey, and take on the identity of a real German citizen who looked almost exactly like Nikolai himself. From there, he would travel on the other man's documents into Berlin. However, he unfortunately fell ill with typhus just before this new mission was to begin, and it was ultimately canceled. Although Nikolai was not briefed on the new mission before arriving in Ankara, documents later revealed, years later, that the NKVD had chosen him to assassinate Franz von Papen in Turkey. Von Papen served as Adolf Hitler's vice chancellor from 1932 to 1934, and at the time of Nikolai's mission, he was the German ambassador to Turkey. So Nikolai was already getting very, very high profile, deep cover assassination missions at the age of about 21 years old. Although his first mission in 1942 was canceled, the following year, Nikolai was sent undercover to a prisoner of war camp for German officers inside of Russia. There, he and another agent who was codenamed Karl spent 30 days posing as captured German officers among the other POWs in order to perfect the mannerisms of the Germans and to validate his command of the German language. The POW camp was a perfect testing ground for Nikolai and Karl because if they were discovered to be undercover Russians by the other POWs, they wouldn't be in any real danger as the circumstances were controlled by the NKVD. Nikolai ended up having a few close calls in the prison camp, such as when he accidentally spoke Russian upon waking up first thing early one morning. But he and Carl remained undiscovered by their fellow POWs in the camp for the entire month of immersive training. In fact, they were so successful at blending in that a separate Soviet counterintelligence team attempted to recruit Nikolai during interviews at the camp. These other agents were not briefed on Nikolai's mission and had no idea of his true identity, but they saw potential in him as well, just as Sudoplatov had. So after passing this final hurdle, Nikolai and Karl flew into Belarus in the dead of night, wearing the uniforms of a German first lieutenant and corporal. Their mission there in Belarus was to assassinate Reichskommissar Wilhelm Kub, the senior German leader for occupied Belarus. After linking up with partisans on the ground who were waiting for them, Nikolai and Karl made their way from the landing field to a nearby town where they hitched rides in German troop trucks to Minsk to carry out their mission. By this point, they were completely surrounded by the enemy who was unaware of just who these two guys were. Once Nikolai and Karl made it into Minsk, Nikolai had to start looking for ways to carry out the mission. 
But he found that this Rex Commissar Kub had some very thorough protective measures already in place and was under heavy guard. A public killing would have been extremely difficult to carry out, and so would infiltrating the big house where Kub was staying. So in the end, Nikolai found a proxy to carry out the most dangerous part of the plan. He made contact with a woman named Yelena Masinek, who was Kub's housekeeper. She had remained neutral in the conflict so far, but her husband had previously collaborated with the NKVD, so Nikolai was briefed on this before he ever arrived. He was aware of this, and he used that information to co-opt her for the mission. So on September 22, 1943, Yelena planted a time bomb underneath Kub's bed while she was cleaning the house during the normal course of her duties. This bomb detonated that night at 1.20 in the morning while Kub was asleep directly on top of it, and it killed him instantly. Nikolai, Carl, and Yelena all successfully escaped in the aftermath of the assassination, but the Nazi forces killed more than 1,000 local Belarusians as retaliation for Kub's death. So they never found the actual perpetrators, but they took it out on the local citizenry nonetheless. For the next year after the successful assassination, Nikolai stayed there fighting side by side with the partisans in Belarus, slowly pushing out the occupying German army. As he and the other partisan fighters slowly gained ground into Western Europe, Nikolai was amazed at the much higher standard of living in which areas outside of the Soviet Union. This was where he first began to wonder if communism and the Soviet system were truly the best for the people. The seeds of doubt had now been firmly planted in his mind. With the end of the war now on the horizon, Nikolai was next sent to Romania. In Romania, he took on another identity, yet another identity, living as a sleeper agent under the alias of Stanislaw Lewandowski. He played the role of a Polish immigrant to Romania who ran a small electronics shop. While there in Romania, Nikolai didn't take part in any significant intelligence operations. Instead, he just worked to fully immerse himself into the local community until such a time as he was needed. He learned to recite pro-democracy talking points to build the trust of the locals over the next several years, but gradually he found himself becoming more and more convinced that there might be some advantages to democratic governance after all. After so much time living and working outside of the Soviet Union, he felt more and more separated from the party and from communist ideology in general. So in 1949, from Romania, he sent a letter back to General Sudoplatov in which he requested to return to Moscow and be released from his intelligence career after eight years of service. His request was granted and Nikolai went back to Moscow and began attending a university program. Although he was still employed by the MVD, which was the agency that had replaced the NKVD by that time. But even this opportunity for studying was eventually taken away from him and his request to resign completely from service was ultimately denied. Instead, Nikolai was ordered on another liquidation mission, this time to Paris, France. A Russian immigre there, whose name was Alexander Kerensky, was speaking out against the Soviet Union and had come to the attention of the MVD. Throughout the history of the Soviet Union and now Russia in modern day, the government has historically marked dissidents and expatriates for death on dozens of occasions and possibly hundreds. This has gone on since at least the 1930s and Nikolai would be the latest in a long line of assassins selected to kill a Russian citizen living in a foreign country. Nikolai was to be issued two Parker fountain pens, which had been converted into single shot pistols by MVD technicians. One of the pen guns would be used on Kerensky and one would be used on Kerensky's friend who had reported him to the Soviet government in the first place. Nikolai's mission was to take care of the problem and take care of the witness at the same time. Very cold, very cold blooded for sure. But this time Nikolai did something that no one expected. He refused to take on the mission to kill. General Sudoplatov was completely shocked by his refusal and even drove directly to Nikolai's apartment to discuss it with him personally. In the end, 
Sudoplatov decided to assign the mission to another operative. For the next few months, Nikolai lived in apprehension that he would be arrested or even executed for saying no to the MVD. But eventually the tension passed, although it was clear to him that if he refused any further assignments after this, he would be in mortal danger. It looks like Nikolai's survival and his continued work with the MVD after this turn of events probably came down to his skill and experience, which were completely indispensable to the MVD at this time. Even though he had refused to carry out his orders, Nikolai was one of only 13 agents under Sudoplatov's command at that time who had the training and the experience required to successfully operate in foreign countries as illegal agents. So Nikolai was, was worth his weight in gold to the agency, no question. In fact, Nikolai's heroic wartime exploits were so highly regarded that a film was made based on his life. It was called Secret Agent, and it premiered in 1947. It was the highest grossing film in the Soviet Union that year, and one of the first of a series of films in the growing Soviet espionage drama genre. Nikolai had unexpectedly gone from dreaming of becoming a famous actor one day to being the subject of a famous Soviet film. But there was something that Nikolai would not learn about for many years to come, and that was what had happened in the immediate aftermath of his refusal to assassinate Kerensky in Paris. Joseph Stalin himself had ordered the hit, and General Sudoplatov took an almost unbelievable risk when he reported back to Stalin that the assassination could not be carried out as he demanded. Sudoplatov had deflected blame away from Nikolai by claiming that there was a problem with his fake Austrian passport. This is what had prevented him from traveling to Paris for the mission. If Sudoplatov had reported the truth to Joseph Stalin, Nikolai would almost certainly have been killed for this breach of trust with the MVD, as so many others had been killed once their loyalty to Stalin and the Soviet government came into question. So it was only through the loyalty shown to him by Pavel Sudoplatov, one of the Soviet Union's most cold-blooded killers, that Nikolai survived. Nikolai's next foreign assignment came in 1952, when he was sent to the Soviet sector of Berlin. There, he began working at field post number 62076, which was the cover organization for the MVD's headquarters in Germany. Nikolai's work there at the time was mostly just administrative, but it did put him into contact with two of the most reliable sub-agents on the Soviet payroll in the early 1950s. The first one was Kurt Weber, also known by the codename Franz. Franz was a devout German communist who had fought in Spain and later in France against the German army. He'd been recruited by the Soviets in France, but now he was working as a low-level police clerk near Berlin. He was a man of action, but now he just felt kind of adrift in post-war Europe years after the fighting had stopped. In France, during World War II, Agent Franz had worked with another man, Hans Kukovic, who went by the codename Felix. Franz and Felix made an outstanding team, and Franz had even rescued Felix after he was captured by the Nazis and sentenced to death during the war. Franz was able to bribe a German prison guard to have Felix transferred to a local hospital for a medical examination. Then, Franz arrived at the hospital wearing a German army uniform and carrying forged papers, which were orders to transport Felix somewhere else for further interrogation. The two men escaped together and were able to rejoin the fight against the Nazis. Years later, in 1952, both men were on the payroll of the Soviet MVD, but they were at this point being held in special reserve for whenever they were needed for a key mission. Well, this mission had finally arrived and Nikolai was in charge, and he had two of the best working under his command. By October 1953, the Soviets were working full-time to spread their influence throughout the rest of Europe as well as intimidate anyone who stood up to them. Defectors, expats, and vocal dissidents who were living outside the borders of the Soviet Union were always at the top of the list for liquidation. By now, Nikolai was 31 years old, stationed in East Germany, and had been working on covert operations for nearly 12 years. He was given the order to prepare for a critical mission 
across the border in West Germany. Nikolai was tasked to supervise agents Franz and Felix in the liquidation of a high-profile target. His new mission was the hunt for a man named Georgi Okolovich. Okolovich was the chairman of a group of anti-communist Russian emigres based in Europe called the National Alliance of Russian Solidaris. This alliance was ramping up its efforts to subvert Soviet rule within its own borders by using increasingly drastic methods. The Solidaris were known to have smuggled anti-Soviet pamphlets across the borders using balloons. They were also operating a program of subversion by approaching Soviet sailors in foreign ports who were on temporary shore leave and trying to convince them of the detriments of Soviet rule and that they should stay where they were now that they were already outside of the Soviet Union. The Soviet government correctly saw the Solidaris as a well-organized threat to their control over the Soviet citizenry, and they decided to take action. Now, before Nikolai even arrived in East Germany, a team of three German MVD agents had already attempted to kidnap Okolovich in 1951, but the mission failed when they were unable to locate him in West Germany. And to make matters even worse, two of the three team members immediately defected once they were outside of the Soviet bloc. But worst of all, at least from the perspective of the Soviet government, was what happened next. After the failed kidnapping of Okolovich, the 10-year-old daughter of one of the two defectors disappeared from Moscow. So Nikolai believed that the girl had been smuggled out of the country by the Solidaris in order to be reunited with her father. If that was the case, that meant that the Solidaris had their own clandestine network in Moscow, which was a major potential threat to the national government. However, the following year, another senior leader among the Solidaris named Dr. Alexander Trushnovich, who was also living in West Berlin, was successfully located and kidnapped from his apartment by another MVD team. This operation just took place two weeks before Nikolai's mission went forward. Uh, unfortunately for everyone involved in this mission, Trushnovich's kidnappers accidentally killed him during the kidnapping. He suffocated on a rag that they had stuffed into his mouth while the team made their getaway. Trushnovich's fate was kept secret until it was finally revealed by the new Russian government in 1992. So for nearly 40 years, his family only knew that he had disappeared. They did not know that he had actually died that night during a failed kidnapping. The German agents Franz and Fritz were activated and traveled from Germany to Moscow, where they spent months training up for the mission. This training included jujitsu, marksmanship, evasive driving, surveillance, and counter surveillance. Meanwhile, Nikolai himself focused on the planning and logistics of the operation, much as he had 10 years previously for the successful assassination of Wilhelm Kub in Belarus. Nikolai traveled to West Germany by himself and brought back a number of small items, such as cigarette cases, handbags, and wallets, to use as possible concealment devices for unique weapons. He then visited the infamous Laboratory Number 12 to personally oversee the fabrication of the unique silent weapons being developed for this mission. Laboratory Number 12 has had many names over the past century, but it has always functioned as a sort of Russian assassination laboratory. I've written about it several times on my blog, so if you want to read about it, you can find more info there. And the scientists and technicians at this laboratory are responsible for creating many types of weapons, ammunition, and unique untraceable poisons that have been used for foreign assassinations since at least 1921, so over 100 years now. Right around the same time that Nikolai was preparing for his mission, another Soviet assassin named Bogdan Stasinski was being issued the very famous cyanide gas gun for the assassination of Ukrainian nationalists in Germany in a mission that practically mirrored Nikolai's own work. But Bogdan Stashensky's story is a story for a future podcast episode. Nikolai also had to arrange for false Austrian passports for the mission participants, which was easily accomplished as the MVD had an agent inside the Austrian passport office in Vienna at that time. After the weapons were manufactured by laboratory number 12 and delivered to Nikolai, the team practiced with them until a fatal first shot was easily accomplished. 
They conducted live fire tests first against wooden barriers and even used a leg of lamb as a more realistic target in order to prove these brand new weapons could deliver the both the kinetic energy and the silent ignition that were necessary for a deniable assassination. The three-man team also did full-scale rehearsals for a variety of different possible scenarios, which included shooting Akolovich from the window of a moving vehicle or staging a car accident with him and then shooting him as they went to check on the driver of the other car. Once the team and the weapons were positioned in Austria and ready for the go-ahead, Nikolai traveled yet again to Frankfurt on his own. This was the first phase of Operation Rhine as they decided to name the mission to kill Georgi Okolovich. But unbeknownst to anyone else at the time, Nikolai had prepared an encoded paper record which documented many details of his work with the MVD and all its personnel there, and he left this document in a safe deposit box in Switzerland before he traveled on to Austria and then to West Germany. Once he was safely in West Germany, Nikolai diverted from his assigned mission in the most stunning way imaginable. Rather than continue working to facilitate the planned assassination, he instead directly approached Okolovich at his apartment one night. Nikolai knocked on the door, and when Okolovich opened it, Nikolai greeted him first in German, then switched back to his native Russian and said, Georgi Sergeyevich, I have come to you from Moscow. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union has ordered your assassination. The murder is entrusted to my group. I can't let this murder happen. Now, Kolovich was, of course, completely shocked by this stranger at his door, but a long conversation between the two of them took place in his apartment right afterwards. And Okolovich believed Nikolai almost from the start because he did know better than anyone exactly what the Soviet government was capable of. Nikolai had hoped that he would be able to get his own family out of Moscow, just as he believed had occurred for one of the previous defectors the year before. But he was greatly saddened to realize that the National Alliance of Russian Solidarists did not, in fact, have the ability to get them out now that he was willing to defect. Nikolai would have to find another way to get the Soviet government to release his family. Okolovich was able to facilitate an introduction to the U.S. government on February 19, 1954. Nikolai presented himself as a defector seeking political asylum, and over the course of several very tense meetings at Okolovich's apartment and elsewhere, the U.S. agents gradually began to believe the story that Nikolai was telling them. At this point, it's not actually completely clear who these agents represented, but they were most likely from the Central Intelligence Agency, which was a relatively young organization at the time. Nikolai reported that a Soviet courier had already smuggled the weapons for his team to the city of Augsburg. From there, his agents Franz and Felix brought these weapons to Frankfurt and hid them inside a car battery in the baggage room at the Frankfurt railway station. The pistols were in sealed plastic boxes inside the battery container, which was filled with sulfuric acid, which was a virtual guarantee that no unsuspecting person would stumble onto them. A few days later, at a scheduled meeting with Franz and Felix, the pair were caught and detained by the U.S. agents and brought in for interrogation. At this point, Nikolai had already arranged for both of them to be offered asylum and not to face criminal charges if they cooperated fully with counterintelligence personnel. Both of them immediately agreed to these conditions and defected as well. So for the next three months, Nikolai was debriefed extensively by counterintelligence agents first at Camp King, just outside of Frankfurt, and later at a remote hunting lodge. They eventually compiled a dossier based on his interviews, which was approximately four feet thick. He was also escorted to Switzerland, where he retrieved the encoded papers he had left there in a safe deposit box and turned over to the Americans. Once the agents had determined that Nikolai was being truthful, a decision was made to use him against the Soviet Union in the most public way imaginable. It was thought to be the best chance they had to reveal to the world the cold-bloodedness of the Soviet intelligence apparatus and to prevent any consequences to his wife and child still residing in Moscow. So in May of 1954, Nikolai became the star of a shocking press conference in which he presented his story to a room 
packed with more than 200 reporters. The tools he was issued by Laboratory Number 12 were on full display. Most famously, Nikolai demonstrated the four firearms and special ammunition he had been issued, which were unlike anything else the world had ever seen. Two of these four pistols that he brought with him were each manufactured with three single shot 25 caliber barrels loaded with hollow point bullets, which were themselves filled with potassium cyanide. These poison rounds contained a mixture of two thirds potassium cyanide and one third gum binder, which acted to seal it into the hollow point of the bullet. Each round contained about a half a gram of poison, which was more than 100 times a lethal dose for a normal adult male. The three rounds were locked together in a unique triple pack, which was loaded into the breech of the pistols from the top. The barrel length was almost negligible, so the shooter had to be standing very close to the targets before firing, but death was virtually assured if the target was struck by one of these rounds. Even more shockingly for 1954, these pistols used both an electronic ignition system, which was powered by flashlight batteries, and used the captive piston ammunition, possibly the first successful experiment into this ultimately very successful realm. When fired, these cartridges are nearly silent because all of the expanding gases are captured behind a piston, which drives the bullet forward while simultaneously sealing the cartridge shut. According to Nikolai, the sound of firing was no louder than a finger snap, virtually undetectable in most environments and situations. Both of these pistols appeared futuristic at the time, but they still generally resembled a conventional handgun. However, the other two firearms were disguised as cigarette cases and were also intended for a close range attack. Nikolai described them as weapons blocks, which is more accurate than calling them pistols as they in no way resembled conventional handguns. With the case lid open, you could see real tobacco filled cigarette tips inside, which concealed the weapons barrel and an expansion chamber inside that functioned as a sound suppressor. The cigarette case lid itself functioned as a safety so as to prevent an accidental or negligent discharge before the target was present. One of the two cigarette cases held two barrels and the other one was equipped with four barrels. The trigger mechanism for both of these weapons was a button on top of the case exactly where a person's thumb naturally rested when holding a cigarette pack. The leather cover for the cigarette case had also been shaved down on the underside which allowed the assassin's thumb to easily find the button, which was not visible from the outside of the case. These pistols didn't have any kind of a sighting mechanism, so the shooter had to be standing right in front of the intended target. But a cigarette case really was the perfect disguise for a silent weapon like this because the assassin could approach the target with the case held out in front of them as if he were offering them a cigarette. A gesture like this would be dismissed as harmless by the target, and also by any witnesses present because it was such a common interaction that could be seen on any city street on a daily basis. Operation Rhine is the only documented deployment of these particular weapons, and they only came to light because Nikolai willingly presented them to the world. Although he described these weapons as designed and fabricated specifically for this mission, you really have to wonder just how many times weapons like these were used by other Soviet agents to liquidate a target without the world ever knowing. Besides the fiendishly clever weapons developed and provided by Laboratory Number 12, Nikolai also told a story that deliberately tugged on the heartstrings of everyone who attended the press conference. He held up photos of his wife and child back in Moscow and worried about what would become of them now that his defection was becoming public knowledge. He described his wife Yanina as his moral center and as the person who had convinced him that it would be wrong to go through with the murder of Okolovich, no matter what the consequences would be to him personally or to his family. But this mention of his wife and child were just the opening act of a complex plan to smuggle them out of the Soviet Union. Nikolai's U.S. handlers had worked out a scheme to have U.S. embassy personnel in Moscow arrive at his apartment just moments after the broadcast began along with members of the international press. They would then offer for Yanina to bring the baby to the U.S. Embassy to hear her husband's broadcast, which was repeating every hour. This would be a pretext to get her out of the clutches of the Soviet government before they realized what was happening. It's a very clever plan for sure. But 
Tragically, for reasons that are still unclear to this day, no one from the embassy actually went to Yanina's apartment as planned. Nikolai felt completely betrayed, and Yanina and their son were sent to a labor camp for more than a year after his defection, and eventually, even after they were released, they were never allowed to emigrate from the Soviet Union. Nikolai was not reunited with his family for decades after he left on his mission. But he also had likely a far more practical reason for defecting rather than just a simple change of heart and attack of morals. His mission had been planned and initiated at the same time as tremendous changes were taking place at the highest levels of the Soviet government. Joseph Stalin had passed away in the spring of 1953 and was succeeded for a short time by Georgi Malenkov with Lavrenti Beria as his assistant. Beria was the former chief of the NKVD and one of the most cold-blooded men imaginable next to Stalin himself. Barely four months later, Malenkov and Beria were deposed by Nikita Khrushchev in a pre-planned coup d'etat. As Khrushchev began working to de-Stalinize the USSR, Nikolai's position and personal safety was now far from certain once he returned home from this mission to Frankfurt. Nikolai's former chief at the MVD, General Pavel Sudoplatov, had already been purged. It's likely that Nikolai chose to risk everything in a bid to escape whatever fate awaited him back home, even if he had successfully completed his mission. For a while after the press conference, everything went reasonably well for Nikolai as he resettled in the United States. He was alone, but he was alive, and so was his family. But the Soviets never forget a traitor. Over the coming decades, they proved this again and again, but Nikolai would be one of the very first of whom they made an example. In September 1957, almost three and a half years after his famous press conference, Nikolai went back to Frankfurt as a guest speaker at the annual POSIV conference at the Botanical Gardens. You might remember that POSIV was the newspaper of the Solidarist movement that was led by Georgi Okolovich. While there, Nikolai suddenly became violently ill just after drinking a cup of coffee at the hotel where the conference was taking place. He was treated first at Frankfurt Hospital and then later by U.S. Army doctors as his condition worsened. The army doctors believed he had been poisoned with thallium, an ingredient commonly found in rat poisons and ant killers at that time. However, they were baffled by some of his symptoms at first, which included severe gastritis and which didn't respond to conventional treatments used for thallium poisoning. Nikolai developed bizarre red stripes all over his skin, liquid was oozing from his eyes, and clumps of his hair fell off of his head at the slightest disturbance. Eventually, they realized that Nikolai was slowly dying of radiation sickness. After they came to this shocking realization, doctors changed his treatment to reflect the new diagnosis. He started receiving regular blood transfusions and finally began to show signs of recovery. Their final diagnosis was that the thallium he had ingested had also been irradiated before it was deployed. However, years later, KGB defectors reported he had actually been poisoned with polonium-210, just as in the case of Alexander Litvinenko, which occurred in 2006, nearly 50 years after Nikolai was attacked. Alexander Litvinenko was also initially diagnosed as suffering from thallium poisoning. The assassination attempt left Nikolai scarred both physically and emotionally. In his 1958 autobiography titled In the Name of Conscience, he wrote, I too was an exhibit of the achievements of Soviet science, totally bald, so disfigured by scars and spots that those who had known me did not at first recognize me, confined to a rigid diet, I was nevertheless also living proof that Soviet science, the science of killing, is not omnipotent. Nikolai also later reported that there was a second assassination attempt against him during the same period. While he was working on his autobiography in Paris in the spring of 1957, he befriended a group of Russian immigrants there, including an elderly woman named Kristina Pavlona. But unbeknownst to him, she was a Soviet agent and began to gradually poison him, leaving him with severe gastritis for the duration of his time in Paris. 
These small daily doses had not yet proven fatal by the time he departed the city, and his symptoms disappeared once he was away from Pavlona. She was also later involved in the assassination of yet another Soviet defector named Viktor Kravchenko, who was believed for many years to have committed suicide in February 1966. After recovering fully and returning to his new home in the United States, Nikolai studied at Duke University, where he majored in psychology. While he was there, his amazing life took yet another unexpected twist. Nikolai became involved in the study of extrasensory perception and remote viewing, which were very much in vogue at the time and were considered to be cutting edge research. He worked under the tutelage of Dr. J.B. Ryan at Duke's Institute of Parapsychology, where he wrote a paper in 1966 titled The Relationship of Parapsychology to Communism. The paper revealed previous Soviet experiments in the field to which he had learned about before his defection. If parapsychology sounds a little bit familiar to you, it's because the Institute of Parapsychology at Duke's University would later inspire the scene in the movie Ghostbusters, where Peter Venkman tests students' ESP abilities. Nikolai eventually went on to become a professor of psychology at California State University in San Bernardino, where he worked from 1968 until his retirement in 1992. He continued his studies in a parapsychology for years, offering workshops and writing papers on the subject. Although it isn't documented anywhere in open source media, I think it's very likely that the CIA made use of their connection with Nikolai during their own studies of remote viewing during the 1970s and 1980s. But that is speculation on my part. Nikolai also had a connection with another one of my podcast guests from an earlier episode. You may remember that I interviewed former KGB sleeper agent Jack Barsky and his daughter, Chelsea Dietrich, for episode number 10. One of Jack's assignments during his 10 years undercover in the U.S. was to keep tabs on Nikolai without ever revealing himself, of course. Like I said earlier, the Soviets never forget a traitor. In 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Nikolai was officially pardoned by the new Russian president, Boris Yeltsin. Despite their best efforts, Nikolai had outlived the Soviet Union itself. He was eventually able to return to Russia and reunite with his wife, Yanina, and even met a son he never knew existed. Yanina had just become pregnant when he left, and his second son was born after he had already defected. Yanina and their children suffered tremendously as a consequence of Nikolai's defection and were never able to join him in the West as he had intended. But... When they were finally reunited nearly 40 years after their last meeting, Yanina said to him, why are you so worried about the past? Everything was done right. And as you can see, everything turned out well. Nikolai passed away in 2007 from a heart attack at the age of 85. But you can't help but wonder with the advances in weaponized poisons since the two attempts on his life 50 years previously, whether the men behind laboratory number 12 had anything to do with his final moments. Regardless of his cause of death, Nikolai Koklov passed away at the end of a long and incredible life at the forefront of the Cold War. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long-form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Juan D. and Sean L. With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.